Hi! Today we're going to review Module 6 in Discovering Computers. We're going to talk about processors, memory, motherboards, everything that's within a computer. And then we're going to talk about a few things that are outside the computer, such as cloud computing services and the Internet of Things. Some of the objectives we plan to go over today are the various computers that are within a desktop computer or a mobile computer. We're going to talk about the different types of multi-core processors and how a processor works, all the different components of it, and the four steps in machine cycle. We're going to talk about the different characteristics uh, in a personal computer. I'll talk about the Internet of Things, the service of cloud computing. We'll talk about a bit and how it travels through the computer and represents data. Talk about how applications and instructions transfer in and out of memory and kind of go through the processor. There's a few great slides that cover that. We're going to differentiate the different types of memory that's available. We'll talk about adapter cards and what their purpose are, and same with USB adapters. We'll talk about the function of a bus. And finally, we'll talk about power supplies and batteries and how to care for your computer. Some of the things that you're going to learn about during this module is when you're buying a computer, a lot of people ask me, what are the things to look at? And these are the four main components for buying a computer. The CPU speed, the higher the speed, the better the performance. The amount of memory, the more memory you have in your computer, the better the performance you're going to get. There are two types of hard drives that are out there. There's the solid straight and a spindled or a disk drive, which the disk spins and there's an access arm that accesses the data. It's still very fast, but a solid state drive is much quicker because it's made up of all computer chips and your computer can access the data from that hard drive much quicker. And then finally, a video card. The more robust your video card is, meaning if you have one with um, processing power on your video card or even more memory on your video card, you can have a really great performing computer. So keep in mind these four things as we talk through this module. So what's inside the case? Well, first off, the purpose of the case is just to protect the electronics from getting damaged. We're going to take a look inside the case, and you'll see on the left side we have a desktop computer, and you can see the motherboard sitting in the back here. These are the different types of adapter cards. Here's a, an example of a sound card. Sometimes it could be a video card that goes into the motherboard. There's the power supply. This is a spindle drive. You can see that disk and the little arm that accesses the data that I was mentioning earlier. There's a processor. There is a heat sink and fan for the processor because processors get very hot and they, there needs to be a way to cool them down. And then finally, there's some memory that's inside your desktop computer. On the right side of this, you'll see a laptop computer that has all the same core components. Here is the motherboard with a lot more things integrated, your video card, your sound card, they're all built onto that motherboard. Your power, as you know on a laptop, comes from your battery, but you also have an external power supply that will power up your laptop and it'll also charge your battery for you. Laptops also have a processor just like a desktop. They have a smaller size memory module and a smaller size heat sink. So the motherboard is the main circuit board within both of those computers, as you just saw. Uh, the computer chips are a series of different semiconductors. Most of the time, the, the material is made out of silicone. They all integrate and talk to each other and work off of each other. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So here's a closer look at a motherboard. Uh, you'll see over here, this is where your memory modules go into the, de the motherboard of a desktop. These are the expansion slots where you would put a sound card or maybe a video card. We're going to talk a little bit later about the CMOS battery and what's that used for. This square area here is where your processor would fit. On this right side of this graphic here, you'll see the motherboard of a laptop. There is also a square area where a processor would go into, but many of the other components are built into it. The video card, the sound card, they're all part of these collection of silicone chips that all kind of interdepend on each other. There's a slot here for a memory module, and um, this looks like this right here is your fan unit to keep your laptop cool. 
So let's talk about a processor and the different types of processors that are available. Uh, the processor is also known as the central processing unit or a CPU. What that does is it carries out some basic instructions that just operate your computer. They talk to your keyboard, your mouse, your printer, your, your monitor, the applications that are on your hard drive, um, internet connections, and so on. So there's a couple different flavors of processors. Most of the ones on the market are multi-core processors. So it is not just one processor, but it's two or four or even more of those. Another component of the processor is the arithmetic logic unit or the ALU, which is, is the one component that handles all the math functions. A long time ago, the math functions was handled in a different chip in a computer. It was called the math coprocessor and you still had a processor or a CPU, but they were all single CPUs back then. And now today we have duo and quad core processors. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that right now. You can see your single core processor here with just one and duo with two, quad with four and so on. And these are some of the way more robust processors that are out there. Now the cost goes up as you get um, a hexa, an octa, or even a deca core processor. These have incredibly high performance because of the amount of processors that are um, that are all built within one processor. It's not just all these processors separately. They're all in one chip. Here's some examples of some multi-core processors. The popular ones out there are from Intel. You can see the Core i5 and the Core i7, which is one of the more popular um, processors out there in the market. AMD also makes their own processor, a lot more popular with your gamers out there. They handle processing a little bit better for games with all the graphics and all the heavy computer code that kind of goes through your, your gaming. This graphic shows the different components within a processor. So we spoke about the arithmetic logic unit, which is um, within the CPU. There is also something called the control unit. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the memory that is inside the processor just to make it perform better. And one of the names of that memory is called cache memory. And there's a couple different levels. This is L1 memory and also how your processor uses registers. This graphic shows how when devices are connected to a computer and they communicate with the, with the processor to carry out a task. So for example, you may have an input device like a mouse and that's going to travel into your computer and go through your processor. Memory is something that is accessed from the processor kind of back and forth. There's output devices such as a printer. So your processor may have a set of instructions, like say that that set of instructions was a Word document that you created and you want to print it out. The processor will then send it out to this output device. And then if you need to save it to your hard drive, there are the storage devices that the processor also talks to your hard drive and saves your file, your Word document, to that, that storage device or your C drive. The control unit is the component that coordinates all the operations of the computer. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the arithmetic logic unit is another component that performs the arithmetic comparison and other operations um, within your processor. So this is a great example of how an ALU um, would work. There are four different components uh, for the machine cycle. Uh, so in this example, the computer is given the math problem 100 times 48. This is the fetch part of where it fetches the calculations and instructions um, from memory in the computer. The next item is it decodes that. This is the control unit that's going to decode 100 times 48 to determine where it needs to go next. Well, since this is a math problem, it's going to send it over here to our friend, the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. So that's going to do the computation. It knows that 100 times 48 is 4,800. And then finally, it's going to store that into memory. And that can, besides it being in memory, it's going to show up on your computer screen with the answer of 4,800. So those are the four steps in the machine cycle. Um, 
as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a, a few different processors out there. I have an example down here of an Intel uh, core processor, but there's something called the clock cycle. This controls the timing of all the computer operations. So to simplify things, the higher your gigahertz is, and you may have seen this in computer ads, then that's going to be a faster clock speed. So my first example is a three gigahertz uh, processor is going to calculate three billion clock cycles per second. In the second example below, you'll see like, for example, the Intel Core i7, the range in gigahertz ratings. If you ever shopped for a computer, you'll see that there's all different types of speeds. The, the higher the number, the faster it is, the better the performance. So you can see a i7 can do 4.2 gigahertz or 4.2 billion clock cycles per second. As mentioned before, Intel and AMD, those are the main players for processors out there in the market today. And processors, they generate a lot of heat. The more computational power that they're using, the hotter they're going to get. So there's three ways to cool down a, a processor. There's a heat sink, and I have a graphic that shows you what a heat sink looks like. There's liquid cool technology, which is kind of like a car where you have a radiator with fluid that goes through the engine and that radiator fluid helps cool your engine. There's also fans in a car, very much like a computer has fans. And then there's cooling pads, which are primarily used for um, laptop computers. So here's an example of how a processor gets cooled down. There is the heat sink fan on the top. There's the heat sink, which is this collection of aluminum vents that sit on top of your processor. So like the way all fans work, there's one side that sucks the air out and the other side blows the air out. So what happens here is as this processor is developing a lot of heat, it's going to go into this heat sink and throughout these aluminum vents, it's going to help dissipate that heat so your processor doesn't overheat. The fan will then suck up the hot air from the heat sink and blow it out into the case of the computer. Then we'll talk about the power supply, which also has a fan, which takes all that hot air within the case of the computer and blows it outside. Very similar with laptop computers, has a very similar design where it collects all the hot air within the laptop computer and blows it out of the side or the back of your laptop. This is an example of that cooling pad that I was mentioning for laptop computers. And we're going to talk about cloud computing. Cloud computing is available for home and business users. There's four main attributes and benefits of cloud computing. That's accessibility, your cost savings, space savings, like physical space savings, and the scalability. So for the home environment, you're probably familiar with things like Google Docs or Google Drive, where you can store files onto your Google Drive for home. Businesses have a similar type of um, service that's available. It's called a um, data as a service. So companies such as Amazon, who have enormous amounts of space, companies will back up their data to someone like Amazon. But the most popular cloud computing service out there is something called software as a service. That's when you subscribe to a company's software and they host your software for you. They have all the servers, all you need is an internet connection, and they deal with all the maintenance of that application, the upgrades to the servers. So it's a big cost savings and it's a big space savings if you work in an organization that doesn't have the physical space for servers. Um, some of the other examples of cloud computing is infrastructure as a service, and that's when you might need um, a collection of servers for your organization to provide different types of services for whatever it is you're trying to do. It could be web servers, it could be database servers for something internally. And then there's platform as a service, which is something like um, maybe like a website. So uh, companies such as Wix will host your website for you and host that entire platform. They give you all the tools that you can use to create your website. So let's talk a little bit about uh, bits and bytes. So there's two types of data out there. There's analog, which is this continuous signal that varies in strength and quality. Computers use digital signals because there's 
two states. It's on or off. It's true or it's false. And there's a few s slides in here that give you a good example of how um, digital signals work. So here's a representation of what physically happens with a binary digit or a bit. There's an electronic charge that tells it that it is on. And if there is no charge, it is simply off. This next example shows you the, the binary um, code for something like the letter E. So you can see for the letter E, there's eight bits in a byte, as we all know. And going left to right on the top row, the first bit is turned off or zero. The next one is on. The next three are off. You got one on, one off, and one on again. So 01000101 represents the letter E. Here's another example of how that travels through your computer. In this example, you'll see that in step one, capital T by pressing shift T on the keyboard, um, it creates the, the code that gets sent over here to the computer and it scans the code for that capital letter T through the electronic circuitry within the, the computer. What it then does is it translates that in step three. Now computers use something called um, ASCII, which is pronounced ASCII. That stands for the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. That is what translates letter T into this binary number down here, 0101. 0100. And then finally in step four, after the processing, the binary code for the capital T is then converted into an image, which is going to show up on your screen. We're going to spend the next few slides talking about memory. Computer memory is physically a set of silicone chips that are used in your computer. What they do is they store the instructions that are waiting to be executed by the processor. So there's three categories of those items. The first is your operating system. When you first boot up your computer, you'll see a little light flashing. That's your hard drive. Just It's just reading from your hard drive and it's taking the operating system and loading it into the memory of the computer. Another is applications. So for example, when you click on Microsoft Word, you'll see that little light flashing because it's reading the hard drive, it's reading Microsoft Word, and it's putting that into memory so you can use Microsoft Word. As you type up your document and you haven't saved it yet to your hard drive, it is stored into your memory. So the way memory gets stored is there is an actual address where an application or a piece of data or your operating system physically get stored onto those little silicone chips. Memory is measured in uh, the size of gigabytes, as we all know. But in this chart below, you'll see in this group of people, for example, this seat J20 is empty and seat J21 is occupied. Uh, that means that Seat J20 is available for your computer to store anything into memory there, whether it's a document or an application. And maybe seat 21 that's already occupied might be your operating system that's already stored in memory. So there's a couple different types of memory. Volatile memory requires power. Um, Non-volatile memory doesn't require any type of power. Um, those memory chips are um, things such as ROM or read-only memory or like flash memory like a USB drive or the CMOS that we were looking at earlier on the motherboard. What those are is um, it's a computer chip that gets stored with some information. It could be a program. It could be data itself like in a flash drive or a thumb drive and it doesn't require power um, for it to remember what is stored in those chips. Volatile memory, however, it's temporary. It requires power in order to have your computer store any type of data to it. So this slide gives a great example of how, uh, how I was mentioning earlier, like when you boot up your computer and your operating system reads from the hard drive, 
goes into your memory and shows up on your screen. Now that your computer has been booted up, you want to call up, um, for example, a browser. So you load up your browser. It may read something from the hard drive, stick that into memory, and then display it onto your screen. In this step three, it shows a great example of um, using a paint application. So you have a graphic now that you found through your browser and you want to manipulate that. So you call up um, some type of program like the paintbrush program because you want to manipulate that image. So it'll read it from the hard drive. It sticks it into memory. So then you can then manipulate that image. And then step four, when you exit the application, uh, in this example, you can see when you exit the browser, it then removes it from memory. Those addresses are now open, so now other programs can now go where the browser was located once before. There's a couple types of RAM. There's DRAM, or dynamic RAM, and then there's something called static RAM. This chart gives the different variations of DRAM and it kind of goes from the slowest of SDRAM to the fastest, which is RDRAM. Uh, the common types of memory that are in computers is your DDR2s and 3s and 4s and so on. Um, as the chart shows here, DDR3 is faster than DDR2, DDR4 is faster than DDR3, and so on. On this slide, it shows you a couple examples of the actual memory module. And I actually have one here that I wanted to show you. So you see the one on the left is a single line memory module, which means that it has contacts right here, these gold contacts on one side. And the dual line memory has contacts and memory on both sides of the chip. So let me switch my camera. And I want to show you a couple of things. This is a an adapter card that we're going to talk about a little bit later, but this also has some memory that is actually soldered onto the card that sits inside of your computer. But this is an example of a memory module from a laptop. And you can see it has gold contacts on this side. And if I flip it over, it has gold contacts on this side and it has chips on both sides. So we're going to talk a little bit about cache memory. We spoke about this earlier with our processor. And there's three types of uh, cache that is available. Level one cache is what resides within your memory. So the best way to think about what is cache memory, cache is like the speed dial of memory. This is a set of instructions that are frequently used by your computer. Another way to think about it is like on your phone when it shows you your your most recent calls or recent numbers that you dialed out. That's kind of a an example of how cache memory works. And what cache memory does is it really helps the throughput or performance of your computer overall. So L1 cache lives within your processor. We saw that on a slide earlier. Um, L2 cache is a separate chip and it has a higher capacity of memory and it gives um, higher speeds and higher performance for your computer. And L3 is really, um, it's a special need memory that really just helps out your level one and your level two cache. So when your CPU is looking for instructions, the path that it goes through is first, it's going to look through its L1 cache. If it doesn't find it there, it'll look through its L2 cache. If it doesn't find it there, it'll look at your L3 cache. And then finally, if it doesn't find it there, it knows, well, it's probably somewhere here in my memory or my RAM. <laughs> Another flavor of memory is called read-only memory or ROM. Uh, that refers to memory chips that permanently store data such as a flash drive. Um, another example is something called firmware. Now, if you have an appliance um, at home like say it's a Roku box or a Fire Stick, uh, you you probably notice that when the power is out and you power your TV back on, it's gonna remember what programs you had loaded on there, what were your recent favorites. That's because it is writing to that memory um, when you're using it. So when the power goes off, it remembers where you left off. 
firmware is um, an operating system for those types of devices or also for things called Internet of Things. Things like your iRing doorbell that has uh, read-only memory in it. It has a set of instructions to use the camera to talk to your Wi-Fi, which then talks to your phone and so on. Flash memory, as I mentioned, it can be erased electronically. It can also be uh, rewritten, just like a USB um, thumb drive. We spoke about a CMOS uh, chip earlier. You saw that on the motherboard. It had a, a small little battery that keeps power to that chip. Now that chip doesn't require a lot of power. That's why it uses a, a battery um, to um, have it retain its information. A great example of a CMOS is, you know when you first boot up your computer, say it's a Dell computer, you see the Dell logo, and it might say, press F1 for the setup or something like that. That's called the BIOS of your computer. It's a, um, a set of instructions that keeps track of the date, the time, what kind of hard drive you have, if your network card's turned on, and so on. And the way that your BIOS remembers that information is through this CMOS, which is kept alive by battery power. If you ever open up a desktop computer, you may have noticed this battery in there. You may have wondered what it's for. And that is exactly what it does. It just keeps your CMOS chip alive. Memory access time is shown here on the next couple of slides. For the most part, computers are measured in something that we call nanoseconds. And in this example, it shows that for the blink of an eye, it takes about one-tenth of a second. But for a computer to blink an eye, it would do it that whole operation in like 10 million times that it takes you to blink your eye. So in this chart here, it shows you all the different types of access time terminology. Um, there's the millisecond, which is a thousandth of a second, a microsecond, a millionth of a second, a nanosecond, which is a billionth, and a picosecond, which is a trillionth of a second. Next thing we're going to talk about are adapters. Adapters are used in desktop computers and file servers. Adapter cards are electronic items that fit into an expansion slot on the motherboard of a desktop computer or a file server. They provide the functionality for a sound card or a video card as shown here on this example. On this slide, you can see a bunch of the other different types of adapters that are available. There's modem cards, there's network cards if you're working in an office and you need to connect to the organization's local area network, you need a network card for that. Um, there's TV tuner cards, so if you want to watch cable TV on your desktop computer, you can get this adapter card, put it into the expansion slot of your motherboard, and you will be able to use those services. On this slide here, it shows you um, your motherboard with the expansion slots and using a technology called plug and play. I'm going to switch my camera and show you an adapter card that I have here. This is an older card uh, that has the gold contacts here, and this is a, a video card. Now video cards are um, kind of a thing of the past. Videos are using USB ports now. But for this example, my camera used to plug into this port and the sound would come out of um, these outputs right here. And this would fit into the motherboard, into the expansion slot, and on the back of the computer, I'd have access to those ports. So in this example, they talk about a technology called plug and play. Now, plug and play has come a long way. We used to call it plug and pray in its day because sometimes the computer would not recognize the card and you'd have to do a lot more troubleshooting. But things have gotten quite good where you plug in a card, as soon as you boot it up, the operating system will recognize that, hey, there's a new sound card here. It will load the drivers for it and you'll be able to play sound through it and use it and go along your merry way. USB adapters, like I mentioned earlier with webcams is a very common and popular use of um, a USB adapter. You simply plug it into an available USB port and that device is ready for you to use. 
buses is the way that data travels through your computer. Um, there's a couple different types of buses. There's the data bus and the address bus. Um, your word size is the number of bits that the processor can interpret and execute at a given time. So the next couple slides will kind of demonstrate that for us. The way I like to think about a bus is like a highway. Um, it is the path that goes from the processor to memory to the hard drive and back and forth. And you've probably heard of the terminology that there's a 32-bit. Um, some operating systems are 32-bit. Some of them are 64-bit. And I like to think of those as lanes on a highway. If you have a 64-lane highway, you're going to get a lot more data traveling throughout your computer than you will with the 32-bit bus. So here are the three different types of buses. The system bus, which can also be known as the front bus, communicates between the motherboard and the components such as the main memory. The backside bus connects the processor to the cache. We were talking earlier about level one cache, level two, and level three cache. And then finally, the expansion bus allows the processor to communicate to the peripheral devices, such as a webcam, or maybe you put something in a desktop computer, like a sound card. That would use the expansion bus. And finally, for module six, we're going to talk a little bit about power supplies and batteries. As I mentioned earlier, in this example here, you see in this power supply, there's a fan here for a desktop. What this does is the hot air from within the computer flows this way. And this is what you see on the back of your desktop computer where it blows the hot air out. Laptop computers use uh, an external power supply. Sometimes we call it the brick because it's Sometimes it weighs as much as a brick, but it kind of looks like a brick. But that's how laptops become so light, especially if you travel with one and you're just using battery power because you're going to be maybe out at school for a couple of hours. Um, this helps reduce the weight of a laptop, and it also puts the heat load for that power outside of your laptop. This slide just shows a couple examples of batteries that are used in laptops or other components, such as um, you have a smartphone here, and here's a laptop battery. A lot of the components now do not have replaceable batteries. Um, it's been kind of a, a trend that I've been seeing um, within technology, where if you need to get that battery service, you need to take it back to um, maybe the, the Apple store or wherever you, you got it from and have, a, have someone physically remove it from that device and replace it. So in summary, we went over the components of a computer with mobile devices. We spoke about the types of processors, the machine cycle, and the different types of cooling systems. We spoke about cloud computing and all the advantages of those types of services. Um, we spoke about all the different types of memory and how it's stored with ROM, RAM, DRAM, and etc. And then finally, we just spoke about adapters, buses, and power supplies. And the last uh, page in module six talks about ways to care for your computer and your mobile device. Um, I just want to touch on those fans that we were talking about earlier. They suck in air and they blow it out. But as a consequence, they also suck in some of the dust. So sometimes you might have like a noisy computer that's probably because there's dust that's kind of clogged up in your fan. So what you can do to fix that, to remedy that, which is a very popular method, is if you use some good old canned air. Just blow it through the uh, fan unit or wherever you see some dust on your laptop or desktop. That'll usually clear the problem. Thank you.